nothing else really matters. I just want to be my full self. I really don't care what my family thinks anymore. I don't care what people from back home think. I just want to be myself. And so every month for Pride is super special to me now. Pride looks like leadership to me and seeing other queer LGBTQ folks across West Virginia and across the state um, or across the nation take on leadership roles, I think is really that next step of empowerment that we're that we're really after. Welcome to Hope Starts With Us, a podcast by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm Matt Raymond, NAMI's Director of Communications, and today I have the privilege of serving as your guest host for this very special episode with a community I personally identify with about pride and LGBTQ plus mental health. We started this podcast because we believe that hope starts with us. Hope starts with us talking about mental health. Hope starts with us making information accessible. Hope starts with us providing resources and practical advice. Hope starts with us sharing our stories. Hope starts with us breaking the stigma. If you or a loved one is struggling with a mental health condition and have been looking for hope, we made this podcast for you. Hope starts with all of us. Hope is a collective. We hope that each episode with each conversation brings you into that collective to know you are not alone. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by a former NAMI board member of NAMI Greater Wheeling, West Virginia, and the first openly transgender person ever to be elected in West Virginia to the Wheeling City Council, Rosemary Ketchum. And we have body positive, queer content creator, brand collaborator, licensed therapist, school social worker, and a TV personality you may know from shows on Netflix like The Circle and How to Get Rich, Frank Grimsley. And we're talking today in honor of Pride Month and about LGBTQ plus mental health. This uh, subject is something that means a lot to me. I am a gay man. I have a gay brother and my father is trans, actually came out at the age of 72. So we have a lot of interesting conversations in our family about nature or nurture. But I want to start out by thanking both of you for being here for taking your time to join us. Uh, very generous of you. And I want to start by just asking each of you a very open-ended question, which is, what does pride mean to you? And why is celebrating pride important for LGBTQ plus mental health? Frank, why don't you kick off? Wow, I just actually answered this question. And thank you, Matt, for just being so vulnerable and sharing that. That's such a such a beautiful journey. I just can't even imagine um, some of the conversations you all are having. Um, but pride means to me, it's it's bigger than just me. Uh, a lot of you may know me from the circle, being the winner of the circle. And after that, I had the opportunity to be in McDonald's, um, a pride parade here in D.C. on the McDonald's flow. It was the first time that I had ever posted about my just existence in the community. Um, I grew up in a very small town in Alabama. I grew up in the church. Um, so I never really felt free to kind of be my full self. And I knew that after I went on TV that the world was going to see, okay, that's who that guy is. And so in that moment, I just actually just was like, oh my God, like nothing else really matters. I just want to be my full self. I really don't care what my family thinks anymore. I don't care what people from back home think. I just want to be myself. And so every month for Pride is super special to me now because it's not like I've been just, I've been living out loud, but now I'm just living out loud without any like care about what anybody thinks. So I post on social media for my family back home to see. They don't ask me any questions. I, they probably already like, you know, we know what's going on with him. Uh, but pride is so special to me just because I finally at the age of 30, you know, feel fully free and fully able to walk in my authentic truth. And just having that um, ability to, to do that is just so freeing and such a amazing just an amazing journey. I'm grateful. Yeah, absolutely. And we know the power of coming out and just being able to be who we are with people. And I think the more people know LGBTQ people in their own lives, uh, sort of the better uh, the acceptance and, and the openness and, and the conversations can be. Uh, Rosemary, let me ask you the same question. What does pride to you and what uh, why do you think it's important for LGBTQ plus mental health? Yeah, thank you so much, Matt, for sharing your story and Frank for sharing your story. It's great to meet both of you. Um, you know, I think something that Frank said really sticks out to me that, you know, I'm also 30 and pride looks very different. Uh, I'm actually 29 
to be very clear, uh, <laughs> almost 30, pride looks very different to me today than it did when I was 20. And I think that carries through your life, what it means to celebrate your identity, what it means to feel empowered. If I was to answer this question, you know, 10 years ago, I would have a very different answer. Right now, to celebrate pride, for me, you know, we talk about pride being a party, uh, you know, but pride is a party, pride is a protest. And when I see folks really living their lives unapologetically, regardless of their, you know, gender identity or sexual orientation. I am really, it's not just inspired by those people, um, but inspired to uh, help encourage other people to take those kinds of leadership roles, whether that's in their own personal lives or in their, you know, profession. And so right now at 29, pride looks like leadership to me and seeing other queer LGBTQ folks across West Virginia and across the state um, or across the nation take on leadership roles, I think is really that next step of empowerment that we're that we're really after. Uh, it coincides with the month of pride, but I think we've also seen a lot of attempts in legislatures and in uh, some policymaker circles and among um, advocates on, on various sides uh, to sort of attack pride, the entire notion of pride and to really demonize the community. I think some would say just to kind of eradicate them, even put people back into the closet. I wanted to ask uh, what what your perspective was on that. How How do you think that's impacting the community and how does it impact you personally, Frank? Let me start with you on that. I think it's just so disheartening. I think to just kind of echo what Roseman said, pride now looks way different for me than I was at 20. And I think at some point, maybe when I was probably maybe 25 to 28, I felt like we were making strides for it. And I feel like the strides that we had started to make are kind of being you know, pull back from some members of our community, especially um, I, one of my favorite um, advocates is T.S. Madison. She's an amazing transgender woman. And I always just hear her talking about some of the things that they try to do to that part of our community. And I also think about how, you know, she even talks about how as a as someone in that community, how she doesn't feel supported by the other people that are in our community. And as a black gay man, I think it is a large part of my responsibility to, you know, we not only need allies outside of our community, we have to allyship within. And I think that's a biggest piece that is missing because we're not only being struck from outside of our community, we're striking inside of our community. And I think it's very dangerous because at this moment, where they're trying to take us, we all need to be on the same front, whether we're black, white, transgender, um, non-binary, whatever it looks like, we all need to be united because if it came down to it, they would ship all of us off together. So we need to be together. And I just think, it, in, you know, whatever happens in our community, it, it impacts us all, whether we really know it or not. So there may be an attack on the transgender community right now, but it very well could turn into an attack on black gay men. It could turn into an attack on lesbian women. We just never know. And I think um, it's it's very sad and it, it really concerns me a lot. Right. It feels like in a lot of ways that trans issues now are kind of being used as a proxy. So, for instance, it seems like society has kind of moved on from same sex marriage as you know an issue of controversy. So some people are kind of using different issues as a wedge. Rosemary, let me ask you the same question, because you are a lawmaker. What's your view of, of these uh, various laws and uh, sort of attacks, uh, whether verbal or in terms of policy? And do you see any reason for optimism? Yeah, I, well, to quote Taylor Swift, I think I've seen this film before. This is not the first time that vulnerable communities like the queer community or the black community or immigrant communities have been under attack uh, by a certain, you know, uh, large minority of people. Uh, and similarly to Frank, you know, in my early 20s, when I was a, a community organizer and protester, I felt a lot of optimism about where we were um, because the conversations we were having felt really productive. 
Um, today, I still feel a lot of optimism. I still, be, particularly because I have a, a very local lens and I'm seeing the work happen on the ground. Uh, but I am frightened by what's happening. I think that social media in particular has, you know, really poisoned a generation of Americans into believing really harmful, dangerous, untrue things about their neighbors. And in my experience, you know, I ran for office. I knocked doors as an open trans person. It wasn't a secret. And I was elected in arguably the most conservative state in the nation. We voted for Trump more than any other state. And what that tells me, among many other things, is that people are far more likely, you know, to trust, to vote, to support a person um, uh, because they know who they are, not because they read something, you know, about them. And I'm hopeful that we're going to bring politics, you know, uh, to a to a more local uh, kind of grassroots level. Um, but that's not what's happening at the the state and federal level in so many ways. So, you know, for young queer people who feel really scared about the future, the future is very scary. Um, but I think the, one of the only ways that we can actually uh, make a difference is by getting involved and by running for office, frankly. You know, I saw a gap in my community, you know, being served and I decided to step up, not because I was trans, but because there were plenty of issues that I wanted to work on. And I just so happened to be part of the LGBT community. Um, and I think if anybody's listening to this podcast right now and saying, you know what, I've really never considered running for office, but I want to do something good. It's been the best experience of my life and I couldn't, I couldn't recommend it anymore. Well, that's wonderful. And it's great that it's been a positive experience for you. But uh, now I'm going to shift to a topic that's a little bit more difficult and a content note to our listeners that it is the topic of suicides and suicide attempts. Uh, we know that within the LGBTQ plus community that uh, the rates of suicide and attempts are very high, unfortunately, and the st statistics are really sobering. We know that lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth are nearly four times more likely to attempt suicide than heterosexual youth, and transgender adults are nearly nine times more likely to attempt suicide at some point in their lifetime compared to the general population. And according to a, a report just released by the Trevor Project, 41% of LGBTQ young people seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year, and young people who are transgender, non-binary, and or people of color reported higher rates than their peers. So why do you think these rates are so much higher for our community? And what, what do you think are the extra challenges that our community faces? Uh, let's start with you, Rosemary. Yeah, it's a really important question. I think that any community that is used as a pawn and whose dignity and humanity is up for debate every single day um, would struggle to feel welcome and to feel like they have a place on this earth. I think that, you know, many of the young people that I speak to uh, uh, feel a lot of, um, you know, uh, desperate emotions around what their future looks like in this country. And I used to tell them that, hey, you just need to stay strong and not focus on those things. Um, and, and for example, you know, stay in the state of West Virginia, you know, sacrifice your happiness to fight for the state. And I don't say that anymore, in part because people deserve to feel safe and to, and to live in places where they feel dignified. And so if there are, you know, communities that are creating sanctuaries for trans people, then those are safe communities. I'm, I don't plan to give up on the state of West Virginia um, because in 2017, a Williams Institute study found that West Virginia had the highest proportional rate of trans youth anywhere in the country. Uh, and that's no accident. You know, we do a lot to support our trans folks, um, but it is easier said than done. What I tell what I tell trans kids here in the state of West Virginia is to find an allied community um, and to work with organizations like NAMI and the Trevor Project and the ACLU, um, because those are really incredible and important um, organizations that are doing a lot to um, reduce the risk of suicide. Uh, one of the other things I want to say is that if folks I know a lot of kind of white cis folks who might not understand why. Uh, you know, self-harm is so prevalent in the LGBT community. And I try to describe to them that when they walk outside as a white person or as a cis person, it is their choice to get involved in politics. It is their choice whether they want to ignore it or lean in. 
as queer people or as the black or, or as members of the black community, it is not our choice to be political. We are politicized every single day. We turn on the, the news, we scroll through social media and our rights and humanities are up for debate. And so, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of work that we need to do to address challenges um, to healthcare, which is particularly one of the reasons why trans folks don't um, uh, uh, seek medical care because they're like, is it even legal for me to go to the doctor these days? Um, but we also need to be very honest about the harm that legislation is causing um, to the mental health of our folks. It's not an accident. Um, and I wish more more legislators would understand that. Frank, let me go to you on that. And again, specifically the issue of uh, suicide and suicide attempts. Uh, what, what are your views on why maybe those those rates are, are so much higher and some of the challenges that uh, LGBTQ plus community faces that um, other folks don't? I think to, again, echo what Rosemary said earlier, social media is really a driver for so many things that we are experiencing today. And as a not only a consumer, but as someone who does create content full time as a general consumer, I consume a lot of social media every single day. And I'm constantly reading the articles. I'm constantly, you know, following things and seeing what's going on. And it's just, I see how our children can become hopeless. I can see how they can feel ostracized. I grew up as a fat black boy. I was probably one of the biggest people in my class. And I remember feeling alone. But the only reason that I knew that I had like that sense of love was because I had an amazing mom while she was still alive. And, you know, she had that same experience, but she was a woman. Um, and she was able to kind of tell me like, you know, no, like you'll be fine. Like they're going to pick on you. This is how you prepare yourself for it. Don't let them, you know, beat you up with something that you already have power over. And I, and I said all that to say that I think that because our children have been afforded the opportunity to be able to identify as whatever they want to identify as and walk in their truth at such an early age, which is a privilege I didn't have and I didn't have the courage to do. I think they are faced with so much more adversity um, as far as when it comes to the media, when it comes to legislation and things like that. And I think it, it can be crippling because as an adult, as me and Rosemary just said, pride for us at 30 is different for what it used to be like. And you have children now that are celebrating pride. And I think that is so amazing. But the amount of things that come with that can be crippling. And like Rosemary said as well, when there's not proper access to health care, not proper access to clinicians, who can they speak with? Their parents haven't experienced it. They don't know if they don't have any mentors in their life. They don't know anyone that has experienced what they're experiencing. A lot of times you have a queer student and it's just one queer student in the whole grade level. And so they're the target. They're the ones that's picked on. If someone comes out as non-binary, they're that non-binary kid. They're that transgender kid. Um, that's that gay kid. And I think that because we haven't put in the proper supports for our children, um, which I think is intentional, I think that we will continue to see uh, the numbers continue to rise until the narrative shifts. But as Rosemary said, that's why this all is frightening for the future. Because, you know, it could be the target of the trans people. It could be targets of the gays. Then it could go the non-binary people. We don't know at which point of our community will we hit next. And I think that's the scariest part. Because as adults, we can manage and we can kind of, you know, figure out, oh, well, this is what's happening. I'm understanding of it. But our children are in danger. Right, Frank, I, I really found what you said about your mother particularly touching and, and insightful because we know the importance of support systems and whether that's uh, your own family or, or chosen family, which I think is something that's really even more important to LGBTQ people because, you know, quite often people come out to their families and they don't necessarily have a positive experience for that. So um, I, I really think uh, that your situation is, is something that is, is very inspiring. Uh, this question is a related one. It's rather delicate, so 
feel free to answer it or not or how, however you would like. But uh, have either of you struggled individually with thoughts of suicide? Uh, I can tell you that that I certainly have. And I think the statistics definitely bear that out. But I, I wanted to see kind of what your own personal uh, experience, um, your own thoughts may have been with that. Frank, let's stick with you if we could. Absolutely. I think growing up, like I said, I had the support. My family was amazing. I did lose my dad when I was five years old and my mom when I was 14. And losing those primary supports, um, knowing at the age of 14, I knew I was different. I knew that I was not like anybody else at my school. And I was like, what's really going on? I didn't have anybody to talk to. I grew up in a small town. I didn't know anybody else that even looked like what I look like I didn't see representation in myself in media. Um, I didn't see myself represented on any TV show. So I've just felt like I was just here. So in those moments where my support has left me, I'm like, well, how am I going to continue to do this? Because as I get older, life is going to get harder. And, you know, I did contemplate in that moment, like, do I really want to continue to be here? And the only reason that I chose to stay here. And it's a story I tell all the time is um, on my computer, there was a picture of me and my three other best friends. And I told I told myself I cannot leave them because they're just going to not be able to survive because I'm the funnest friend. Um, <laughs> and I always joke with, you know, one of my friends and I used to be like, you all saved me um, because I that in that moment, I said, you may not have this primary support from your parents, but you do have chosen family in your friendships. You do still have family members and, you know, you have to stick out the fight because your life is going to help someone else's life. And so I just, you know, that's why I try to live every day and be positive and just impart great things into the world because you never know how a conversation you have can shift somebody's entire mindset. I, after I, I'll never forget and I'll cut it off. I'm, I get long winded. Um, okay. but I'll never forget after I won the circle, I was in Houston, Texas. I was at a pool party and a young lady came up to me at the pool party and we, you know, we're all having a great time. We were, there were, there were libation <laughs> and she came up to me and she, um, held my hand and she said, thank you. And I was like, you know, for what? And she was like, you saved my life. And I was like, I looked at her really strangely and I said, huh? And she was like, I was so depressed and sad. And I happened to see your face on the bulletin for the circle pop up on my TV and I never had watched it. And I was like, he looks really happy. Like, what's this show about? And she said, I watched your show and it was the first time I had laughed in six months. And I'm telling you that I would not be here if you had not did that. And that always triggers my brain to tell me that I needed to stay here because all those years later, even if I just saved one person, that girl is still here because I just showed up and was kind. And I think that we just just need more kind people in the world. Yeah, that shows you the power of sometimes uh, just being yourself uh, can have such a powerful impact on on somebody else. And, uh, you know, I, I do think just the, the fact that who you are and being a communicator and uh, living your life as you do kind of unapologetically and uh, seeing how you interacted with other people, for instance, on on the circle. I think it's very uh, within the realm of possibility that just just doing that, just being yourself can save people's lives. They said such a great example. And I mentioned my father earlier, and uh, she came out as a transsexual transgender in uh, about six years ago at the age of 72. And she's been very, very upfront and public about her story and, and advocacy. And it's just been so inspiring to me. And, you know, I, I told her that when she came out, I said it was just I, I, the moment I've never been more proud of her in my life. And it really kind of healed a little bit of a rift between us. So that's, that's uh, hopefully a little bit of inspiration for someone. But uh, Rosemary, let me ask you, are, are you comfortable talking about any particular moments or experiences you've had uh, in the past with uh, suicidal thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have had a quite a, um, a linear mental health journey, thankfully, and I've not experienced suicidal ideations. And I think it's, and I've thought about that because I, I speak to a lot of other trans folks um, and it is incredibly common. Uh, and I, I think in my experience, it's a testament to my parents. You know, my parents were, um, you know, blue collar folks. My dad worked in the local factory for as long as I can remember. And my mom was a waitress on and off raising myself and my two younger brothers, and my older sister, um, not formally educated, but 
um, when, when they knew that I was different at four and five years old, you know, they had a lot of questions. They, it gave them anxiety, but they led with love. And I think I took that for granted, assuming that, Hey, they're my parents. They're supposed to love me without realizing that that is not the case for so many people. Um, and so finding that, um, that family, whether it's kind of, um, uh, biological or chosen, I think is really, really key. The other thing that I think gave me so much privilege and something I'm so lucky for is that I transitioned relatively early. I started, you know, uh, being able to verbalize my gender identity at four and five. And then by 10, 11, 12, I started dressing, um, uh, you know, in alignment with my gender identity. And that I think really, um, gave me the confidence to now at 30 years old, you know, feel like I am fully transitioned and, and a, an adult in the most empowered way. Um, and I think about, you know, your experience, Matt, and having a parent that transitions so late, so much later in life. I mean, that, that takes so much courage and bravery and patience. You know, I just, I, I think that, you know, um, Frank and I are very lucky that, you know, um, we, uh, we all live in, in the 2020s now, and this is a conversation we're allowed to have, you know, but if, you know, being transgender in the 1970s and eighties, um, and even before then was just not, it was just not acceptable. It was not a conversation that you would have. And, and so I feel very grateful for my, for my mental health experience, but always keeping an eye on it. Right. I think we get, you know, when we feel well, we forget that mental health exists. It, mental health is only a conversation when it's a problem uh, rather than saying, okay, how do we make sure that we're feeling good and that we're doing things and we have a routine? Um, I think those three things are really key. Yeah. And we say again and again, you are not alone. Look for look for those communities, look for those sources of inspiration. They are out there. There are people who will love you absolutely the way you are. Uh, so just reach out and certainly reach out to NAMI if uh, uh, if you're having any issues like that. Uh, Frank, we're about to shift into something you talked a little bit uh, about earlier. Uh, a recent survey that NAMI and the Adobe Foundation conducted found out that young people and LGBTQ plus respondents or more likely than older adults and heterosexual respondents to say that engaging in a, crea a creative activity could lead to reduced feelings of depression or hopelessness and develop a sense of belonging in a community. Frank, you're a young person and you're creative, also a content creator, but um, you also work with young people as a school therapist. So l let me ask, what has your experience been like personally uh, merging or the interface between creativity and mental health? Do you see this as a form of self-care for you even? Absolutely. Uh, during, so I actually did leave my full-time um, social work job to pursue content creating, but I still do have amazing opportunities to speak on mental health like this. And I still pop into like different kid settings every now and then. But while I was a therapist in the schools, I maybe had a traditional therapy session, maybe less than 10% of the time, <laughs> um, because I believed in meeting the children where they are. Um, and I believed in inspiring them to think outside the box. Um, I, I wanted to play games with them. So I, I understand how they play Uno. How do you think? I wanted to ask you, what do you like to do? Do you like to do your hair? We would talk about sneakers. We would talk about basketball. We would talk about any and everything um, because I wanted to inspire them to dream through their, their creativity outside of just being smart in the classroom. Um, so we would go outside and play basketball and talk about therapy. And, you know, I would be very immersed in their life experience and what they wanted to experience out of life. I definitely think that mental health and the creative space is so important because as an adult, I now operate fully in my creative space and it is the most enjoyable experience that I have. Um, some days it is stressful, but most days it saves my life. Um, being able to walk in your authentic truth um, all the way around in all facets of your life, you know, whatever it is that you like to do. I believe that I'm so blessed to be able to even say that I'm a full time content creator. That is something that I love to do. And I'm able to do that full time and able to keep my lights on, keep gas in my car. I still go on trips. Um, and I, I remember how I felt when I would sit in the office some days and I didn't feel good. I have a chronic um, 
skin condition called hydratinata superativa. And some days I just don't feel good. Some days my body is inflamed. Uh, last week I had bumps all over my face and my body because it was my body was in inflammation period. Um, and those days I would just still have to push through and go to work and not only think about my own mental health. I'm trying to save 10, 20 kids. I'm breaking up fights and I'm just like, wow, that is why I always wanted to push the kids to operate in their creativity. What do you like to do? Because one day you may be able to do that and that be your thing. But if you grow up in a in a situation where you're constantly pushed to go to school, constantly pushed to go to college, not saying those things are not great because I did all of those things. But what if your gift that you have down inside of you is just enough to do everything you ever needed it to be? So I definitely think um, creativity is a great merger for, you know, just mental health. Yeah, Frank, I also think um, like one of my subversive opinions is that capitalism is anti-art and just like mm. anti creativity. Um, and, uh, and for particularly for young folks like Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they're like really anti nine to five in the office, these kinds of things. And those conversations are almost exclusively about their mental health. They're like, mm -hmm. I don't feel good. Um, if I don't get enough sleep, I don't feel good, you know, staying in an air conditioned office for 10 hours of my life every day. Um, and, and, I think that's really, I think that's progress. I think that's yeah. really good. Yes. Um, yeah. Cause yeah, their self-worth is not no longer tied about to what you can produce as a member of this economy, but what you can be and how you can feel good about yourself. Um, exactly. I think that's powerful. Yeah. I think that's so, I, I, I grew up in a small, like I said, I grew up in a small town and once my, um, I was pretty much raised after my mom passed by, you know, my elderly grandparents and my my older uncles, and they will always just be like, oh, go to school. I want to be a broadcast journalism major. And mm -hmm. I remember they was like, oh, that's not going to make you a lot of money. And I just always think back, like, I would have been such a great news anchor. Like, yeah. oh, my God. And I just wish that I'm glad to see that, like you said, the progress of there are people that go and do what, exactly what they want to do. There are people that are news anchors and things like that, that didn't even go to school for that. Yep. Um, so it's just, it's so inspiring because I remember growing, you know, I would see my grandparents talk about how they had to work. Um, they, they worked the same jobs for 30, 40 years to get their retirement, just to make enough money now to just pay their bills. And I'm just like, that does not seem fun. I don't want that life. Yeah, I do not. <laughs> and they were working jobs that they, you know, didn't even want. And I know the times are much different now, but, you know, I'm very grateful that, you know, at the age of 29, I could say, I'll leave this job. And if I would need another one, I'll just find another one. And yeah. my people, I didn't even tell my family about it because I knew that they would have three cows. <laughs> and I just was like, I literally just told them, probably three months ago, I was like, yeah, I don't work at the school no more. I just didn't tell y'all. And I've been doing just fine. And they're still, now they're calling me like every week. How you doing? You all oh, right? And I'm just like, yes, I'm fine. Like, I will get another job if I need to. I work in yeah. mental health. There will yeah. always be work. Uh, Frank, let me follow up on, on the whole creativity aspect. You've touched on this a little bit, but, um, you've been building up your presence on social media. As you mentioned, you've gained a lot of popularity by winning the circle, which is all about social media. So on one hand, some people criticize social media for exacerbating or worsening young people's mental health, causing body dysmorphia with all the filters and so forth. On the other hand, the Trevor Project report that I mentioned earlier showed that LGBTQ, transgender and non-binary young people really see online spaces as their safest, most affirming places, really even more affirming sometimes than their homes and schools. So in what ways do you feel like social media can be a source for good and positivity? And, and uh, what ways do you think people might need to protect their mental health on social media, if any? So the good and, and sort of the, the protective aspect of it. I think social media can be an awesome tool if used correctly, as if a lot of things. There are great ways for you to use scissors, but there are also terrible things that can happen if you use them incorrectly, um, which is, I think, another important piece about education, uh, proper support systems, especially for our children that are able to have access to social media at such a young age. Uh, my little cousin is eight and she's on TikTok. And I think that is insane. Um, but what parameters are 
the parent setting for those moments on the internet? What type of relationship are you creating in that social media relationship? As you stated, I have gotten a lot of, um, gained a lot of followers on social media, uh, in part for my ability to go on a show and win it. But also I think people stick around because they're very in tune with the journey. And I'm very good at storytelling. I'm very vulnerable uh, in my captions. I tell all my business to social media, not all of the things, but I tell the parts of the story that I feel will help resonate with people. And my community has kind of been like, I go to it when I just feel like someone needs something. And I know that people look to my post sometimes, whether it's just me walking across the street looking confident or I'm telling a deep story about how I may, you know, miss my mom and I'm grieving today. Um, I think the authenticity in that is empowering. And I think that if used correctly, it can be an amazing tool. But I don't want people to only have the support of their social media community and only have the support of people online because as good as it can be, it can be just as bad. I've had people tell me, oh my God, under a post um, about me grieving my mom, I had people tell me, oh my God, where we, I know she's proud of you, et cetera. And then I had two or three people say, F your mom. Um, she deserves to die. I've seen those comments. I've seen those DMs. However, my I've already trained my brain. I don't live in the comments. Uh, if it's not positivity in there, I quickly jump out. Um, and that's how I protect my mental health. But I think some people, when they get so invested in their community, um, especially if you start from like childhood and you're always on the Internet, I think in some of the moments where you kind of maybe need to take a step back and you lean into the Internet, those very same people that you, you that you think will lift you up will quickly attempt to tear you down because everybody's every people may be watching the show, but everybody's not really there to see the good in the show. They're there to criticize. And I think we have to be mindful that it's two sides to that social media game. It's unfortunate that so many people like that exist. I would also point out that a lot of uh, social media platforms and tools have, uh, you know, different settings and tools uh, built into them that, you know, people can get uh, some of those protections. So I would, I would definitely uh, encourage certainly parents to be aware of those and, and to work with uh, uh, with your kids on that. Rosemary, we kind of framed this whole discussion in terms of self-care. So I want to ask you. What do you do for self-care? Does it involve creative pursuits or social media or, or do you have other safe spaces? Uh, self-care, I don't read the comments. There, there are more things that I don't do for self-care than I do for self-care. <laughs> I don't read uh, social media comments. Um, I, I, I utilize social media as a tool for in-person connection as much as possible because, I, as, as Frank mentioned, I do think that we use it as a... Um, uh, uh, maybe as a crutch when we uh, don't have the opportunity to meet people in person, but I think it's really important to use it that way. Um, I love music. I play um, a couple instruments and I'm a Swifty and I was at the Ares tour concert. And so <laughs> that is my, that is part of my self care. Um, Did you get in the building? <laughs> I got in the building. I was in a very far away seat, but it was, there's no bad seat at, at a Taylor Swift concert. Um, and that's its own kind of sense of community where you have, you know, 80,000 people, uh, you know, with shared values, singing the same lyrics. I think that's very powerful. Um, so, yeah, those are a couple of the things that I do for my own mental health. I think, you know, it's, it's a cliche phrase, but boundaries are really key. And I never learned there was never a how to set boundaries 101 class when I was in college or when I was in high school or middle school. And so there was a lot of trial and error, you know, letting people into my you know, space to interrupt my peace and having to recognize that that didn't make me feel good and that's not OK. That's really tough when you're a public figure um, uh, because people feel that you owe them your uh, vulnerability in your life and your time and all of these things. And um, in a certain way, you do, particularly if you're an elected official. But it's that much more important that you develop really strong and healthy boundaries. And there are plenty of opportunities to do that. I'm sure NAMI has some great resources on boundary building. Um, but it's each person kind of addresses that uh, and it takes a different approach to setting boundaries. And I think that has done, um, you know, uh, miracles for my own mental journey. 
That's great advice. Uh, and even though the month of June is coming to an end, Pride is really something that is supposed to happen all year long. So people in the LGBTQ plus community, we don't stop holding on to our identities when this month comes to a close. We don't stop needing support or resources. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the uh, activities and reactions of public policymakers and legislators. But Rosemary, let me start out with you because you've been a relentless advocate in your public service for our community and so many other communities over the past years. In 2020, as we mentioned, you became the first openly transgender person to be elected in West Virginia, and you continue to be actively involved in politics. So coming at it from that perspective, I wanted to see what you think, not just yourself or other people in the LGBTQ plus uh, community can do, but what can other political leaders do uh, across the spectrum to help uh, with our community's mental health? And also, what do you think the community, uh, more broadly speaking, can do to support our mental health? It's a really important question. Thank you for asking. You know, I, I think that one of the most important things that thoughtful legislators can do is hold their colleagues accountable. Usually we go, we think that it's enough to be an ally or even enough to be in the community and be in office. But, but it isn't because we have to look across the aisle and hold our fellow electeds accountable. And that's really difficult when they're on your side. You know, it's really easy when they're across the aisle and they, you disagree on a thousand things to call them out. It's really tough when there is one issue that splits you and it might be, you know, uh, you know, transgender health care. It might be, you know, book banning. It might be something. Um, it's really easy. And I see it all the time, whether it's at the local level or at the state level, legislators go, oh, I don't want to burn this bridge um, on this one issue. And that's really tough because that one issue is thousands of West Virginians, is hundreds of thousands of Americans um, that are address, you know, that are dealing with this, millions of parents and allies. And so I think that's really hard, but it, it pays dividends at, in the very end. Uh, and, and that's something that I've taken on. And thankfully, my other members of city council are quite thoughtful and really and really good, and they hold themselves accountable in many ways. If you're not in elected office, a couple things that I think you can do. Um, you know, first and foremost, attending your city council meetings, your county commission meetings, you know, uh, in small towns like the city of Wheeling, we have less than 30,000 people. Uh, not a lot of people reach out to us. Not a lot of people come to our meetings. And I know that's similar across our state. And so your presence at a city council meeting, it, you cannot underestimate the power that that has just being a face for your elected, not just to hold them accountable, but to also give them advice and ideas. I know a lot of people, um, it's really hard to make the distinction between ignorance and bigotry, you know, because people who are bigoted inherently, you, we're not going to get them. It's, you can't argue with those folks. They're quite illogical. They're not, they're not there to build policy with you, but people who genuinely are ignorant to the issue and just don't understand, they can be, they can be helped. <laughs> we can do a lot um, to get them on the right side. And I think that, you know, um, your one of your obligations potentially as an ally or a member of the queer community is to do that um, for your local legislators. And then my last piece of advice is that sometimes it is easier to replace a politician than to convince them to do their jobs. And so, uh, again, I think that running for office at whatever level you're comfortable with um, is really important. Win or lose, it's really important to run because you get to you get to change the conversation. Frank, let me ask the same question uh, from you and, and your perspective. Uh, what can people who are listening or watching right now do to support LGBTQ plus mental health? Maybe there's a parent listening who doesn't know how to support their child or a friend or a classmate or a colleague or, or someone along those lines. What would you say to them? I think my answer would be I think Rosemary did a great job of answering the question. I think my answer would be very simple. And I would say show up for those people that you want to ally for as the way you want someone to show up for you if you were in that very same situation. I think a lot of people think that we chose to be gay or people chose to live these different lives. And I'm just like, I just woke up like this, honey. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, the life chose me. And I don't think, I think when people are able to actually conceptualize the thought that how things are for us in our community, how disparaging it is like do you really think that someone would be like oh let me check this box and check this lifestyle to live um we're just trying to live our best life 
in the most authentic way as we can and be happy in that life. And a lot of times the allyship is literally just showing up for the fight and not just showing up in June. Uh, continue to be an advocate, continue to be an ally, and just continue to treat us as if we're people because at the end of the day, every day, we are people just the same. We, um, we're all different, but we all really come from the same place. And I just wish that, you know, we, I really wish that people would understand that aspect of it all. It's, it's to me, it's really very simple. Um, I love, regardless, I love the dog that we have in this house just as much as I love my neighbor that I see maybe once a month. Um, if my dog is in trouble, I'm going to help him. If the neighbor's in trouble, I'm going to help her. Um, um, and, you know, we just need to lead with love and not just in the month of June, not just during Black History Month, not just during all these other random months. I think we should really get back to just being kind to one another. Well, again, uh, great advice. And I think it's very inspiring. And as we uh, come close to the end here, there's a question that we like to ask every single one of our guests. And the world can sometimes be a difficult place and often it can be hard to hold on to hope. That's why for every episode, we dedicate the last couple of minutes of our podcast to a special segment that we call Hold On to Hope. Frank and Rosemary, can you tell us what helps you hold on to hope? Rosemary, let's start with you. There are a lot of things that allow me to hold on to hope. I think first and foremost, being able to pull people into politics um, has been so rewarding because I think politics by and large is intimidating for a lot of people and it doesn't make them feel comfortable and it feels icky. Um, but part of the work that I've decided to take on as a member of our local city council is to help people understand what their role is um, as a member of our community. And I think that that has made folks feel empowered and feel you know, more willing to come and, uh, and, and advocate for their communities, uh, whether that is because they've got a pothole on their street or they don't feel protected by the current law that we have people feel much more compelled to do that work. And I think I'm most inspired of that group, the kids who are involved, who um, really don't know a time before social media. They don't know a time before political uprising. They don't remember a time before you know, a recession and, a, and all of the incredible political turmoil that we're experiencing. And so, you know, they don't know anything else but to fight. And I'm grateful that we'll be able to build a channel for those folks. So that gives me that gives me some hope. Frank, what helps you hold on to hope? I hold on to hope because I'm able to have these type of conversations and I learned something new out of all of these conversations. You know, I've learned something from both of you all today. And I'm as, again, I grew up in the South. And I used to sit in front of my floor model TV and just to be able to have some of the conversations and learn some of the things that I've learned um, is really inspiring to me. And I hope that everyone listening to this uh, leaves with some inspiration to just keep holding on. Uh, again, there were there was a time where I didn't want to. I was thinking about not even being here. And the fact that I'm here is a, a reason to hold on to hope. And, you know, Rosemary, I was going to comment on the earlier how you have had the experience of not even having any type of um, suicidal thoughts. And I think as someone that identifies as transgender, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that. And so that to me says progress. That to me is inspiring. That to me makes me smile. You know, Matt, you talked about how your father is now identifying as a transgender and all these years later. And to me, that's inspiring. Like you, you know, you kept that inside of you for so long. And I know the the freedom that she now feels that makes me want to hold on to hope because I see stories like the stories I was told today and you know, we just have to keep that's why our stories are important. That's why our advocacy is important. And that's why, you know, you never know who will hear this and say, oh, well, you should go listen to this. Or you don't know who may be listening to this and they may be thinking of, oh, I'm, I'm getting tired of the fight. And they hear someone, you know, still living, still pushing, still fighting. So it's these moments that remind me to hold on to hope um, because 
you know, we're getting somewhere, even if the journey is slow. Uh, I always try to tell myself that, you know, the world is spinning and I don't even know it. So if the world <laughs> is spinning and I don't know it, then something good is on the way. Mm. Well, uh, uh, before we close out, let me just ask uh, either of you, are there any questions that I didn't ask that you would like to answer? Any closing thoughts that you might have? Um, Rosemary, let me start with you. Um, no questions that I, I think you didn't ask. I think those were great. Um, I guess final thoughts. Every community should be a mental health sanctuary and every uh, city council or community organization should be having conversations about what mental health looks like in their community. I care a lot about urban planning and how a city actually influences behavior. And those are conversations that we're just starting to have maybe 50 years too late. And so I encourage folks, you know, to think about mental health when they think about how to build a city or how to build an organization or how to, you know, approach situations with their family. I think that through the lens of mental health, uh, so much more can be accomplished than we're doing today. Frank, any parting thoughts from you? Oh, well, I had a great time. I do know that. Uh, I, I definitely don't have any questions. I appreciate the opportunity to even, you know, come on the platform and speak. Matt and Rosemary, you guys have been amazing. And I really, I really enjoyed it. I love being in conversations and spaces where I get to learn something and actually get to, as a content creator, I use my brain, but I feel like I use a different side of it now than what I used to when I was working directly in mental health. So just having, having the conversations, being able to be vulnerable, allowing me to have the space to share and, you know, even cre creating and cultivating a space where I felt comfortable to share and be vulnerable. I think that is so important. And I think, you know, like Rosemary said, we need to continue to have the conversations, even though they are late. We must continue them because this is how you cultivate a space that is full of kindness, full of love and full of joy and makes the world a better place. So I'm grateful that you all thought of little old me going to talk to y'all. <laughs> Well, Frank Grimsley, Rosemary Ketchum, thank you so much for your time. I, I thought it's been a, a very wonderful discussion. Certainly uh, it helps June go out on, on a high note as, as we come to the end of Pride Month. This has been Hope Starts With Us, a podcast by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. If you're looking for mental health resources, you're not alone. For more information about NAMI, Pride Month, or LGBTQ plus resources, visit our website at nami.org slash pride. To connect with the NAMI helpline and find local resources, you can visit nami.org slash help, text helpline to 62640, or dial 800 950 NAMI or 6264. To reach the Trevor Project's LGBTQ plus youth suicide prevention lifeline, visit thetrevorproject.org slash get hyphen help. You can text start to 678-678 or dial 1-866-488-7386. If you're otherwise experiencing an immediate suicide, substance use, or mental health crisis, please call or text 988 to speak with a trained support specialist or visit 988lifeline.org. Always remember, you're not alone. Show pride in June and every month of the year. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>